pick a couple of sites that, that, that we've done. And then I realized that, oh, we've done loads of sites in, in the Black Mountains, you know, that's where we're based. So, um, and so I thought, well, I'd, I'd, first of all, I'd mention very, very quickly a couple of the sites, paradoxically, that I'm not going <laughs> to talk about. Um, one of those is the, um, uh, we excavated a, a rather nice, um, grand um, 18th century villa in the center of Krakow under the, uh, the Conservative Club. And, um, and that was an amazing day. It was literally just, you know, sort of um, 200 mil uh, underneath the ground. And there was this, this, this great big um, uh, mansion owned by a local solicitor. And the Conservative Club had reused these um, barrel vaulted um, cellars uh, as, as the beer cellar. It was absolutely lovely. And then we, then, then we find out once we left that they, the, they then um, sold the site, and now, um, now a, a chain supermarket is going to be moving in there, much to the horror of uh, the whole of Krakow, I understand. So, um, and we've also been working at um, Plankatic Park most recently on the chamber tomb there. Um, there's a new path that's gone in, and we did some excavation work there. We also did um, some multispectral analysis there of the field to see if we could pick up any remnants of the chamber tomb um, with varying degrees of success. Uh, and that sort of leads me smoothly on to talk about um, uh, our present projects. We're, we're, we're a straightforward archaeological company, but we're a fairly new archaeological company. Uh, I sort of cut my teeth with the Glamorgan Gwent Archaeological Trust. I worked for them for uh, more than 15 years and then decided that the commute from Abergavenny down to Swansea was more than I could cope with with two young children. So um, in 2017, I decided to, to, to go out on my own, trying to find that elusive work-life balance. But, um, but then I've ended up being even more busy than I, than I was before. But, um, but there we go. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is the work that we do. Um, we do, we do you know, common or garden archaeological work, but we also use a lot of drones, a lot of photogrammetry, a lot of LIDAR in the work that we do. And we've, we've tried to sort of move into a, you know, a seamless, uh, uh, complete, uh, digital way of uh, recording archaeological sites, so I'm going to touch on that that briefly. So here we go. So one of the first sites that I'm going to talk about today is uh, Gandhiris Forge, and um, of which you, yeah, and Hills Tramway, which which I'm sure everybody is uh, is aware of, is well aware of. Um, this uh, lovely painting here is the forge. This is dated to about the 1820s. Um, I found it, um, it was a, an image that I saw for sale, if you can believe that, um, uh, um, but with uh, not much, it was on uh, the, the, the Tate, um, it was in the Tate Museum for a while, um, and not much is known about it, but I suspect that this image is one of the images that Michael Blackmore used for his wonderful reconstruction drawings, which I will um, endeavour to show you in a second. So that... The reason we were there mainly was because Western Power uh, had to replace a load of H-poles in the Sheldon Monument area. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to drive great big massive track machines down Hills Tram Road, much to the horror uh, uh, of CADU um, and ourselves. Um, so what CADU asked us to do is they wanted to quantify how, um, you know, how, you know, basically what, what you know, what the damage potentially could be from these massive machines, you know, moving down the tram road. So we were, we were asked to carry out a, an archaeological watch and brief and a, and a survey, and I'll go into the results of that um, in a second. But just briefly, Garn, there is a forge. It's, um, uh, it was built um, uh, around about 1815. Um, it's an offshoot of the uh, Blenavon Ironworks, Blenavon Ironworks starting in uh, 1787. Uh, by Thomas Hill and Benjamin Pratt, and a, and a, and a Welsh-speaking Welshman, if there is such a thing, um, <laughs> called Thomas Hopkins. Um, and he came down, he was managing um, fur furnaces at, um, at, at Rudgeley, and they successfully uh, uh, negotiated a 21-year lease um, from um, the Lord of Abergavenny. Um, which they, they you know, essentially took it off of the, the Hanbury family. The Hanbury family had been there um, since about the, the mid-16th um, century uh, uh, with many charcoal iron furnaces um, uh, in the area. The Llanetli furnace at the bottom of the Clinic Gorge being probably one of the, the, the more famous ones. 
Um, and they took over and constructed um, uh, uh, the furnaces. The Garnvirus furnace was primarily the, uh, used um, to process the pig iron into um, wrought iron bar uh, uh, and plates, uh, and then they needed a way of getting that um, to the, um, the Brecon uh, and Abergavenny Canal, uh, and, and down, you know, at north and south then, down, down to Newport and, and to the docks. And they did that by constructing um, Hills Tram Road, um, the, uh, you probably can't see much of that writing, I don't know if you can, you, you can see it, but um, um, at the height, uh, at the height of, the, uh, 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 of, the, uh, uh, of the works at Garnaviris, there was about 450 people live, living there, um, and they were producing um, over 200 tonnes of, uh, of raw time um, per week. They had... Uh, um, uh, some big um, puddling furnaces there, um, a steam engine, um, and they were using Henry Court's um, process, which he developed in the in the late uh, well, the early 1780s. Uh, Is that going to work? So I wanted to include this. I don't know if you're a fan. I'm a huge fan. Michael Blackmore, um, his his you can see his archaeological illustrations all over the, the World Heritage Site area, anywhere, <laughs> anywhere, well, anywhere around here. Um, and they're absolutely wonderful, and they're really, really accurate. And so this um, shows the forge as it would have been in about uh, 1850. Um, this is really, you know, just before it really sort of uh, uh, didn't become commercially viable anymore. But you've got the forge, if I can use my thing there, you've got the forge here. You've got a stack square there, so if anybody uh, knows Blenavon, you've got the big stack square that they that use for the, the BBC programme. Um, this is a almost identical stack square, but in, in miniature. There was also pubs up there, the, um, the Queen Vic, or the Royal Vic, as it, it, was, it, was, as it was called, uh, at the back here, and, and workers' housing as well. And then you can see from this lovely image, which again, I think you probably used that, that, that image I first showed you um, uh, as inspiration, all the network of tram roads and, um, uh, uh, that you can see across the, the landscape, including the one in the bottom right-hand corner, which is, uh, which is Hills Tram Road. So Thomas Hill uh, uh, built the, well, basically there was a level driven in from the Blenavon side in, into the mountain, and he extended that in around about 1815, um, to produce a 1.5-mile uh, tram road tunnel. At the time, it was the longest tram road tunnel um, uh, in, in Britain, possibly, possibly the world, dare I say it. Um, its principal function was to connect the, uh, the, the Blenavon Ironworks with uh, mainly, mainly with the quarries at Tyler um, and Pusti, uh, and then uh, to Garnviris, um, because before that, there had been the, the only way to get the limestone that the uh, ironworks needed was to take that over the mountain, um, and they, they did that. They, they, there was a there was a pack horse way that went that went from uh, the Tyler quarries on Gilwyn Hill, and it went all the way up to Keepers Pond, and then uh, dropped down from Keepers Pond into the uh, Blenavon Works and was tipped off into stays uh, into into the works there. At Garnviris, um, they were already having um, problems with, um, e even early on, with, with the amount of slag that they were producing. So they realised that the, um, the Hills Tram Road, as it passes through the works, they had to build a cut and cover, cover tunnel um, to get it past the works uh, before it looped around the um, uh, uh, Blorange Mountain and then dropped through a series of inclines down to the wharves, the canal wharves at Llanfoist. Now, the reason I'm showing the only reason I'm showing you this is because I just think it's lovely. So, this is Michael Blackmore again. Um, we were very lucky. We were given the 1972 archive. So, there's only ever been one excavation at um, uh, at Garn and that was in 1972. And Michael Blackmore just happened to be one of the illustrators with the Abergavenny um, Steam uh, Society, and um, he was asked to do a site drawing, and. That is the best site drawing I have ever seen in my life. You know, like uh, in 1972 to draw a lovely isometric uh, drawing. Um, and it's perfect for us 
um, because it tells us exactly what was going on then as well, because obviously 1972 was a little while ago now, uh, and things have changed on, on site. Um, there were things like, if I can scrabble across, the way bridge over here, which up until the, the, the 1950s and 60s um, was roofed and there was a gentleman living there. Um, there's a lovely picture in the archive of, uh, of this chap growing cabbages. There's no way in hell I would ever want to grow any vegetable <laughs> there because it is a very, 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 very toxic um, uh, landscape. So that gives you a really, really brief kind of picture of, uh, of Ganadiris. It was a really, really important uh, um, site. It kind of... Um, it was, uh, it was no longer profitable um, after about um, 1855, and the works were, and the engines and um, furnaces, anything of value, was moved over to Forge side, on the other side, uh, the south side of uh, uh, Blenavon, um, and it was, uh, it was abandoned. But people stayed living there up until the 1960s. Um, and there's a wonderful film um, on, um, on the BBC, which you can still get on, on YouTube. And I would, if you um, uh, Google the Lost Village of um, Pulse D and, uh, and watch it, it's wonderful because the, the council um, by 1960 in their infinite wisdom um, decided that the whole area up there was a slum. So they cleared everybody out. There was no electricity. There was no running water. Um, it was um, a, you know, really fossilized in time. And they cleared everybody out, um, moved them down into, into um, uh, bungalows. Uh, down, down, down in uh, Gilwyn and, uh, and other places, Lanfoist. Um And then they bulldozed the lot. Um, uh, most of the, the houses were pulled down at, the, at that point. So there, that's a bit of background. Um, what we were asked to do, we were asked to do two surveys. So we use drones. Um, so we were asked to do a, a really large um, uh, survey. There was about 12-ish, a little bit over, hectares that we surveyed, and we wanted to, to create a digital twin. We wanted to be able to know uh, what the landscape was now, because also um, it, it was a good excuse to go and do a survey as well, especially if Western Power um, were paying and, and not CADU. So, um, so CADU were quite keen on that. So we did, we, we did the big survey, and then we did an archaeological watching brief whilst Western Power came in uh, and did their, uh, and replaced the H pole. They replaced a couple of H poles, but the main one is they had, they had to come in off the road here. They travelled down onto the uh, on hill. This is Hill Tram Road here, and they had to get up to a H pole all up here. And they have this most amazing. I don't know if you've if you've seen it. They've got this amazing, most amazing machine. It's like a it's like a crab. It's like a, an excavator, but with additional arms, and it just like claws its way like some dystopian horror movie up the um, up the hillside it was um, it was amazing to watch but nevertheless that meant there was lots of plant down there lots of diggers moved around lots of tracked vehicles so we were asked at the end of it then to repeat the survey um, and um, and to see what you know what what had changed what had been what, what had been damaged um, and if anybody I know there's, there's there's some here that have experience with photogrammetry and um, and, and survey work with drones, you become obsessed with error margins, and we are absolutely obsessed with error margins. And, and, and uh, as soon as you constrain the model to uh, the ordnance survey, you become obsessed with trying to get, you know, you know down to millimeter accuracy uh, uh, with the model. Um, you become quite, well, I do anyway. I do. <laughs> So what we produce, as well as a 3D model, we produce what's, what, what's, what's called a, a, an author mosaic, and that's actually where the photographs, there was about 6,000 photographs that, uh, that we took uh, of the site, are um, stitched together pixel by pixel, um, and uh, to produce a true uh, Google Earth style uh, image, but it is actually the, the, all the images um, stitched together in, in a measured way. Um, and that enabled us um, to create these high resolution renders um, of the site, which you can begin to see. You can begin to see some dark areas here, which weren't in previous surveys. You, you know, you can begin to see where the wheel ruts and the things that are going on. But most importantly, because we're able to produce such a detailed um, uh, record, we're able to, um, this is actually the 3D, 3D model. Um, it came out rather well, even if I do say so myself. What, what you end up being able to do then is produce two-dimensional uh, uh, plans and drawings um, of the damage 
um, and you can then compare that to the original survey uh, and to see what is what has changed and, and and in the end with this site not not a lot it was only some superficial damage to the surface of the tram road as it uh, as the machines rumbled down um, Caddy were very happy. The landowner was not very happy because that meant that he he, uh, he wasn't going to get paid as, <laughs> as much money <laughs> by Western Power because there wasn't that much damage. But um, and he was insistent on you know us finding every last scrap of damage that we uh, that we could. But uh, but to be fair to them, they uh, <laughs> they, were, they were quite respectful. Um, there was a, there was quite a bit of damage. Again, if you're familiar with the site, there, there's the information board up here. Um, another one of, uh, uh, of Michael Blackmore's um, uh, drawings up there as well. There was, a, there was quite a bit of damage up there because that, that, that became a sort of an, an impromptu uh, uh, <coughs> sort of um, car park, uh, as it were. So what we decided, rather than delve off into the Neolithic and, and, and other sites, we decided that we'd stay uh, on a sort of a, a, an industrial theme and keep it within the, the World Heritage site. Um, so we were asked to come and survey a tiny little barn um, uh, associated with the tiler quarries. So again, the tiler quarries are those ones. They are 1786-87. Um, uh, they were opened up um, for uh, the, the, the Blenavon Ironworks because obviously the ironworks needed a lot of limestone to, access, to act as flux to, uh, to make all the slag uh, stick together in the furnaces. Um, and in fact, most of the tram roads um, across the... World Heritage Site are mainly limestone. Yes, they they were utilised for uh, uh, for the uh, for the collieries as well, but you know a large proportion of them are to do with you know getting limestone from um, places like Gilwyn Hill over over to the uh, uh, over to the ironworks. So this was a fairly innocuous looking barn. Uh, there it is. Um, it was uh, the Royal Commission had been up there. Um, and thought it was rather rather important because it was um, it was associated with the, the cottage and the cottage was um, anecdotally the uh, it, well, every resident that had ever lived there had said that it was the the quarryman's arms um, and that was passed down from resident to resident family to family so it became enshrined in law that it therefore it must be the quarryman's arms um, but there's no actually evidence for this at all I suspect it was probably somebody's house and where people, um, you know, at the end of a, a hard day went and got, you know, fairly well inebriated. Um, but, but who knows? But nevertheless, we went along to have a look at this, what was supposed to be a, a stable. And um, it turned out to be quite a, a, an interesting um, building. Um, we couldn't find, you know, the, the, the um, as you might expect, the, um, so the Tyler settlement here was established as quarry, uh, for the quarry workers for uh, uh, t uh, the quarries at Tyler and, uh, and Paul Stee. Paul Stee was connected, but it was a little bit too far away, but mainly for, um, uh, for Tyler. And it's there, the first, the, the 1847 Flanesley Tithe map has them on it. The, um, the, uh, the first edition uh, Ordnance Survey map has them on there. But curiously, this, this barn doesn't really appear um, until, I'll use my finger, until um, you get to the first edition. But I suspect that, um, that actually this barn is, it was there um, uh, uh, you know when the, the tithe was was was, um, was drawn up and surveyed, and I suspect it was probably contemporary with the openings of the quarries, or if not the opening, maybe you know within 20 years of it opening, which I'll come into in into a second. So as I alluded to earlier, that the, the limestone was was, was taken over um, by horse um, by horse tracks, basically, um, uh, at, at, at the beginning of the, the working life of the quarry, um, and then we have a wonderful um, uh, a wonderful bit of um, uh, 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 survey work, or, or rather um, reporting, done by the Reverend William Cox, which I'll come on to in a minute where um, he records the, uh, the, the fledgling um, plateway being built. Um, but why, I've included another, sorry, I've included another uh, Michael Blackmore um, uh, uh, image there, but sadly, that's not come out, but that is, that's Gilwyn Hill, and you can see it's awash with qu quarries and, uh, uh, and, and tram roads. Um, but why, um, why? Well, 
actually, as well as the um, uh, Blenavon Iron Works, um, the lime was a growing trade. If, you, if any of you have walked along the, as I'm sure you have, um, along the canal, um, you'll have seen that on every single wharf, um, Gilwyn, um, um, uh, Llanfoist, and Lang uh, Llangata, Goitra is a big one, you all get um, these really, really big lime works. And so as well as lime going over to the ironworks, lime became a really profitable um, uh, business. Um, and where was it going? Well, quite a lot of it um, was, was, was used as fertilizer, but we don't really need that much lime, not, not, in, you know, not around here at least. So it was going down um, the canals to the docks, and then it was going across to, the, uh, you know, to England, to the Quantocks, where they were trying to improve um, you know, the, the soil over there. And then we were getting all of this amazing material culture back, um, uh, gravel-tempered, uh, uh, Devon gravel-tempered ware. Coming back, you find that all across South Wales. It's in everything. Um, so there was this massive lime trade. And so um, everybody was trying to get in on the act. Um, so you can imagine the canal was very, 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 not just with, with coal, but actually lime being a, a, you know, fundamentally a really important um, uh, commodity. Now, I mentioned um, the, the Reverend William Cox, and uh, he, um, he did a survey in 1798-1799 uh, of, um, of Monmouthshire, uh, as it was then, um, mainly because um, it was too dangerous to do a great tour uh, you know, in France or down into Italy at the moment because... Um, um, you know, there was these damned Republicans, um, you know, upsetting Europe at the time. So, um, so quite a lot of uh, wealthy individuals were, were going around and doing grand tours of, uh, of, the, of the home counties. And I'm glad they did, because we've got an amazing, um, uh, if, you've, if you've ever read the Reverend Cox, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's two volumes. It's got loads of um, wonderful um, uh, uh, images in it as well and plans um, but this one sticks out in my mind because he actually came to the Tyler quarries he actually came to Blenavon and he came and had a look at the quarries and he's one of the first commentators ever um, to record um, from a, 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 a tram road um, uh, being built he actually went up there and witnessed it um, being built um, and you know I've just copied a couple of things here um, and uh, you know, he describes how, how they were how they were built, um, how they were put together, um, the uh, the tram road sleepers, um, the fact that um, uh, uh, they initially had uh, cast iron sleepers, but uh, they were prone to breaking, so they ended up going over to timber because they could absorb the vibrations from the um, uh, from from the um, uh, from the drams, and then. He ends, he ends one, one passage with this one, and I'll read it out because it is absolutely wonderful, and, um, and I want to try and get this into every single <laughs> report we ever write on this area because it is amazing. He describes the, the Hills Tram Road, um, and certainly um, the tram road over um, uh, from Tyler, uh, as winding round the tides of precipices in a picturesque object and the cars filled with coals or iron and gliding along occasionally without horses impress the traveller who is unaccustomed to such spectacles with pleasing astonishment. That's just wonderful language. That's amazing. Um, but I've only managed to get it into one report so far, but no, nevertheless. So that's the kind of context that we find this, um, this you know, rather... Uh, average looking cart shed in um, but nevertheless it was uh, it, it was it was on its last legs there was a gigantic crack uh, down the, the, the western side the building was was falling to pieces um, and we were asked to go and make a a, a, a digital twin of it um, to preserve it because it was going to be lost and obviously it was important because it was a stable relating to the quarryman's arms Oh, hum. So we did a drone survey. Um, we mixed that with some terrestrial cameras and we produced um, some really high um, density point clouds and 3D meshes. And we also produced um, very, very detailed um, orthomosaic uh, images as well. In the process of recording the building, um, we discovered that the building is only half a building. 
that once it was a, a, a much larger building, we were able to use the 3D model then to interrogate um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the building long after we've left, left site, long after the building had, had gone. Um, so we were able to you know, discover that actually this wall here is a pretty new wall and actually we've got an archway here and it was actually a really, really, really uh, quite big um, a cart shed, uh, bigger than you would expect for, you know, a, a, a quarryman, perhaps. Um, uh, you know, a lot, um, a lot of resources and uh, uh, money probably went into it, and you can imagine certainly one or two um, large carts um, being stored in there. Um, and... Um, Certainly more important than, you know, I would have thought um, a small stable. We had a good look around the inside. It's never been used as a stable in its life. Um, the, the ceilings are too low. Any horse in there would have coughed itself to death um, in, in short succession. So what I think it is, I think it's quite, I think it's probably, um, if not original, but, you know, um, an early um, cart shed associated with the, with the Tyler Works. Um, uh, probably associated with getting either the workers or their materials, their tools up into the quarry um, to do, you know, to uh, uh, and to you know um, to harvest harvest quarry quarry the quarry the stone and get it over to the Blenavon Works. Um, so, whilst uh, a fairly innocuous little um, uh, 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 cart shed. Um, it's now, um, at least now it's preserved, so in the future, um, if anybody wants to know what it used to, <laughs> what it used to look like, there's a very detailed um, record. Did we go over the top with it? We probably did a little bit, but it was, uh, it was such a nice little building um, anyway. So, um, staying within the, uh, staying within the, the World Heritage site, we have also were invited to do some work at the Clerk Ironworks. Um, and uh, this was, uh, if, again, if any of you are familiar with the Clitic Ironworks, it's largely been under um, uh, vegetation for, for, for most, most of my living memory anyway. It's been under huge swathes of vegetation. You can't really um, uh, see much of it. Um, and uh, Monmouth County Council, CADU, uh, um, started a, a conservation programme so the site was initially cleared of vegetation. You can see this is, this is, this is a, a drone shot of the, the site, relatively clear of, uh, uh, of vegetation. And we were asked to go in and produce a digital twin, uh, a 3D model of the site, um, as well as all the other, uh, the other things. And also to look at phasing and to try and understand the, um, uh, the building better, because it had only really been investigated once in the, in the uh, 1980s by Anne Wilson. Um, who I think worked at the park at that time. But it's a really interesting site. So I've included, I wanted to include a, a couple of, before I delve into the, the 3D stuff, a um, bit of history on, on the site. So the, um, we've got some wonderful uh, uh, images. The, the, the more famous one is um, uh, uh, John Wood's uh, Rivers of Wales, um, which, talking about hay, I did see. In a, in a bookshop uh, in Hay for £800. Didn't buy it, but really wanted to. But, <laughs> but wow, but what a book anyway. Um, but there is a Cardiff uh, University have got a, a really good uh, a copy of it as well if you ever need to, to look through it. But um, so this shows the, the original um, ironworks with the, with the furnace number one and furnace number two and this amazing launder um, that uh, took. Uh, uh, water from the Nantdire stream to to um, uh, uh, to power a huge uh, 42 foot uh, um, cast iron, um, if you can believe it, water wheel. It was um, founded um, by uh, Edward Fear and Thomas Cook, um, 1793, uh, uh, and um, it, you know about three years later it was. Uh, uh, they were joined by um, the Kendall brothers, um, and uh, the Iron, the Clitic Ironwork Company was was established. Now, Edward Freer, um, probably many of you will know, um, he's he had a very very famous son, um, Sir Bartle Freer, who went went around um, slaughtering Zulus uh, uh, among other things and uh, and doing <laughs> thoroughly dis disruptive things, and was called back to uh, called back to the UK, and it was all brushed over. 
um, and, um, and he was given uh, jobs uh, elsewhere in government. But nevertheless, it, uh, he was born, Sabatov was born in Clitic House, which is one of the main, um, uh, which is a big white house next to the Llanelli Furnace, which was built in around about 1693. Um, originally, as I said, there was two furnaces. Um, furnace number one was 1793. Um, furnace number two, 1797. They weren't really, though, um, although furnace number one um, was in blast. I don't think furnace number two was much in blast before 1805. Um, that's when you get the, um, the, the, the records um, for, um, for how much uh, uh, fuel, uh, uh, iron was being produced. Um, we also got um, uh, a third furnace was added um, and then a fourth uh, furnace was added. Um, the third furnace was added in about 1826. Smarts Bridge was constructed about the same time, 1824. Um, and then by 1842, there was a fourth uh, furnace. And uh, if you can believe it, they had a Neath Abbey Ironworks um, Bolton & Watt 24-inch steam blowing engine as well um, added about that time. The plans were drawn up in about 1835, 1836 for it. And they brought it up from Neath all the way cross-country. On the on, you know, <laughs> on the back of carts and uh, and horses, and I just that in itself is a is a staggering achievement to bring a steam engine all the way um, uh, you know, across country. I thought I'd give you another another one of Michael Blackmore's amazing uh, 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 images. So this is his interpretation of uh, the works in around about uh, 1840 at the height. Um, uh, this, uh, you've got furnace number one here, furnace number two here. This is often called furnace number three, but it's not, it's furnace number four. Um, furnace uh, number three is over here. Um, this engine house here is in completely the, the, the wrong place. This engine house is actually, um, uh, must be in front of the works because there's a furnace here, a, uh, uh, as we discovered when, when all the vegetation was, was, uh, was stripped off. Um, it was producing, it, was, um, it wasn't a particularly happy ironworks, it was a profitable ironworks, but because they borrowed so much money to get it going, it was never, um, they were always in trouble um, uh, financially. So whilst it, it was profitable, they were always, um, always in financial um, uh, peril. Um, they started off by producing around about 1,600 um, tonnes a year um, with uh, furnace number one. Um, and then by the 1840s, they were they were producing over 10,000 tons uh, a year, which is uh, which is a, you know a, a respectable amount. Um, we've got some good records about who was working there. There were lots of surveys done in the mid 19th century, particularly of, of children um, uh, in um, uh, in the iron working in the ironworks, and there were. Um, uh, up to about, um, there was four or five hundred people working in the ironworks and then there was, um, you know, another sort of six or seven hundred people working um, in the allied industries, you know, uh, working the tram roads, the quarries, the collieries, uh, 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 you know, up and down the, the Clitic Gorge. Um, and, um, but peculiarly, uh, this site sported um, a, uh, a school. Um, it was located next to, um, well, in, in between the, um, the current bridge, as you go over the clinic, and Smart's Bridge, there was, um, there was a small school building there, um, and girls up to the age of about 11 um, had to be in school, um, which is amazing, really, when you think about it. Um, they did try and convert it to steel, um, but it, it didn't really, um, it didn't really work. Um, and then by the 18, well, 1815-3, there was a board meeting where they decided that that was pretty much it and they were going to have to sell. Um, they did sell it. Um, uh, they, it, it. They tried to do some, uh, 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 to, to create, to make plates there. That failed. Um, they carried on working at the forge, so the Llanelli Forge. Um, which had been associated with the charcoal furnace uh, uh, of the same name across the river. Um, that forge continued um, uh, uh, to be used, and actually that was converted to a tin plate works. Uh, and so industry carried on there, but by about 1871, um, this site uh, completely closed. So, oh, there we are. <laughs> I thought I, <coughs> and I cut it down from 200 slides as well. Um, 
So Anne, uh, Anne Wilson, um, uh, who I've never met, um, uh, um, she excavated the works in, in the 1980s, and this is the only intervention that we've had. She uncovered um, furnace number one, furnace number two, what she thought was furnace number three, but is actually furnace number four. Um, part of the, um, uh, she also uncovered part of the casting house uh, here as well. There we are. Sorry, it didn't work there for a minute. Uh, and then I thought I'd, give, I'd include a quick picture of um, uh, anybody that routinely travels up the, the Clitic Gorge. Um, may or may not recognise this, but this is the, the A465 being built. Um, and at that time, uh, the, uh, the Clitic Ironworks had been turned into a uh, cement works. And you can see that the, where the former charging houses were was now, there were stays up here. Um, and they were producing uh, uh, or uh, making cement up here. Um, it was a gravity-fed operation. Um, most of the, uh, um, the workers' housing and the, the managers' housing uh, at that point was, was, was beginning to be abandoned. And I suspect that actually a large part of the site was preserved because of the amount of um, uh, material that was dumped over the top. The coking works, so there were, there were, uh, there was, uh, this is where the coke works were. That was largely destroyed um, by, by this time. And then you can see as little as, uh, you know, sort of seven years ago, the site was absolutely covered in um, vegetation. So when they cleared the vegetation, it was done by Ibex. Um, it was amazing to see the whole site. Um, and what Cadu wanted was, a, was um, a really detailed 3D model of the site so we could capture it now because what does vegetation do? Bloody stuff grows back again, doesn't it? And um, so, and it and it has. It's you know, it, it started to grow back already. So, but what we've what we've uh, uh, been able to do is we've been able to identify that yes, we do know where the, th the third furnace is because it's here. We've got voussoirs going off to um, that would have um, would have come over to a bridge house. There's no way that we could have had a Bolton and Watt engine in, 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 in here. There wouldn't have been room, so it means it must have been out here. We've got our fourth furnace here. Um, and we've got furnace two and furnace one there. So for the first time, we get a really, really good in-depth look um, at the site, and we're able to start um, phasing it with a, with, a, with a fair degree of accuracy without even having to, to put a trowel in the, uh, in the ground. We're also able to do... I'm winding up now, Paul. <laughs> we're, also, uh, we're going to miss the Brinall. I've run out of time, sorry. Um, we're also able to do some fun stuff. So... Um, we've worked out where uh, the 42-foot um, uh, wheel would have been. We, now the vegetation is cleared. Um, we've been able to find um, uh, the, the, the inclined stonework, which would have, um, which would have housed the, uh, the wheel. And we can then chop the model up in CAD, and we can start to build um, uh, and try and interpret uh, at, you know, where it would have sat. This is important. Why? Well, actually, if you're doing conservation work, you need to know where the gearing is. You need to know where, where to look for stuff. So we've got a huge 40-foot, 42-foot uh, wheel in here. Um, and, and up here, you would have had some serious um, uh, gearing and apparatus to hold it in place. Because you think of the, the centrifugal force of a, of, a, of, a, um, of a wheel that you know, is, is, is almost as big as the wheel at Cavartha. And that was an absolutely humongous um, uh, wheel so re really extraordinary also the other the other thing to mention is you know now the vegetation is gone we can we can see the back um, back of the charging house the calcine kills back here actually some of the work um, that um, the uh, uh, they did when it was a cement works to stabilize the walls has weirdly preserved it so so actually um, the, the cement works, while everybody laments uh, that, 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 that they went in and they did destroy quite a lot of stuff, they've actually gone some way in um, uh, pr you know, preserving the site. But what this has left us with is lots more questions, but also we can, um, we can sit now in the comfort uh, uh, you know, of our office and we can interrogate the 3D model and, um, and because we've, uh, we've got it down to you know, sort of um, centimeter accurate, we've even recorded... Um, all the passages behind the furnaces, we, we've recorded all of the subterranean passages as well. So you can really, you know, you can really interrogate the model and then, um, and also for, for years to come. I won't now talk about the gate for you all because I would have had to have read it. Um, much.